Sight it, called Prokyon, the raccoon. Welcome back to Fur Bluffs. How have you been? What news is there from the Federation? Is them all well? Many other animals were starting to gather around. Please, this isn't a social visit. Prokyon, who is your chief now? That would be me, actually. Saitet wondered if he ought to ask Prokyon for a private audience, but decided instead that he should get as much information as he could from as many people as he could. I'm here looking for information about a crime. All of the food stores in the Federation have been stolen. There was a collective gasp. Has anything strange happened around here? Anything at all that might give us a clue how it happened? There was a lot of murmuring, but no one claimed to know anything. Then a voice came from the back of the throng. I have. The crowd parted to reveal a small penguin. What do you know? Saitet asked him. My sister lives in Prendor. She told me that a few days ago a wizard came by, riding on a unicorn. He told the mayor that for a hundred gold he could magically create enough food to see the entire town through the winter. The next day the same wizard and unicorn came to the ice caves and made the same offer. And was the offer accepted? Yes, in both cases. The week without water was really hard on the crops in Prendor. Those that got water died of poison. Those that didn't get water died of dehydration. The harvest was pretty awful. As for the were-penguins, what can I say? We live in an ice cave. Thank you. Saitet looked at his wrist, intending to report his findings, then realized that he was still a bat and his bracelet immaterial. He didn't like to go looting in front of the other talking animals. Something about it just didn't seem right, so he flew off into the forest to find a place to change. Across the canyon, he changed and reported his findings. When he was finished, he looked down the road and saw a couple of animals walking up the path. Curious. He hadn't seen these two before in fur bluffs, and they were both standing upright as they walked. Saitet suddenly realized what he was looking at. Keepers! I think I've solved the problem, said Jun as he handed Rugi the charm he'd been enchanting. Try it now. Rugi concentrated. The charm glowed in his hand. Then he fell. Up. Rugi sat on the ceiling, rubbing his head. I don't think that's quite right either. He set the charm on the ceiling down and promptly fell to the floor, then immediately was hit on the head by the falling charm. Ow! Kerak could not sleep that night. He was worried sick about Sopak. The wind was howling outside, and the air was turning bitter cold, which only made him all the more worried. The house seemed so empty. Sopak was halfway to the North Pole by now. Point had gone home for the night. Sujan no longer lived here, and Saitet was in fur bluffs. Kerak thought idly that maybe he ought to get a dog. He lay staring at the ceiling for hours, and eventually did fall asleep. But it was a fitful sleep. In his dreams, Kerak stood looking up at a statue. It's almost finished, someone told him. And indeed it was. Only the very top of the head remained to be completed. Once it was finished, people would be able to climb up inside the statue of Sopak and look out over the wide and beautiful country which Kerak had helped to create. But something was wrong. A crack appeared in the base of the statue. It went up toward the head. Chunks fell out. Kerak watched in horror as the statue's fingers fell off, followed by the hand and the arm. Where the pieces fell, they burst into flame, setting fire to everything around them. Onju placed a hand on Kerak's shoulder. If I were you, I'd move, he said. Kerak took the advice. Suddenly, he was in another time and place. The room was completely white and empty, but for Kerak and Onju. Where are we? asked the commander. Am I dead? Does this look like Stormhaven? No, you're very much alive. I'm the dead one. As for this place, this is a room that just got painted and doesn't have any furniture yet. Onju opened the door. He led Kerak down a hallway and toward an outer door. Kerak now found himself in a city. Turning around, 
he saw that he had just emerged from a castle. It was high and well fortified. The bottom was built like a fortress, while the top was more like a palace. The castle filled the space between the two cliffs. Welcome to the city of love, said Onju. What is this place? asked Kerok. This is your home, Captain. This is Camp Dimtorch? <laughs> no, and I'm very sorry about what happens to Camp Dimtorch. Why? What happens? I don't think you really want me to spoil it for you, said Anju, and really it would only depress you. But I have brought you here to show you this. It would be impossible if not for you, and if not for the Federation you built. Kirok suddenly realized that the sun was behind him as he faced the cliffs. We're on the south side of the mountains. This is the other end of the pass. That's right, and you're going to love it here. We made it! We dug all the way through! Now, Kerok, I'm going to tell you something very important. There is a seed. A seed? A seed that will allow what was destroyed to grow back. When the war is over, you must find the seed. What war? We're at peace. Trust me, there will be a war. Onju, do you know about my son? Is he alive? Don't worry. He's cold, but he's still alive. He's going to lose a few fingers and toes before he comes home, but they'll grow back. Oh, Sopak, said Kirok in dismay. The dream changed again. Onju was gone. Kirok was in a garden. Before him was a freshly dug hole. In his hand was a seed. It's time, he told the seed. Spring is here and you must be planted. I don't want to go down there, said the seed. But you must. Seeds belong in the ground. The seed cried and pleaded, Don't bury me, please. It's cold and dark in the ground. But it's only for a little while. But I will die. Kirok's heart was breaking for the little seed. Its crying and pleading tore at his heart. Nevertheless, he put the seed into the ground and covered it with dirt. His hand on the ground, he could feel the seed's heartbeat slow and stop. Then something wonderful happened. The seed sprouted into a tree. The tree spread its branches wide, and they quickly became laden with fruit. You see, he told the tree, you died as a seed, but now you have become a great tree. Thank you. I never should have doubted you. I was afraid, but it was worth dying to become this. What is your name, friend tree? Captain Kerok Fireseed. Kerok's eyes were suddenly wide open. He found himself back in his bed looking at the ceiling. It had all been a dream. But now, somehow, he felt calmer. He felt sure now that he would see Sopak again. And soon. The following day the weather was horrid. A terrible blizzard had hit the dark forest. Saitet found himself holed up in a tree in fir bluffs. Most everyone in the Federation was trapped indoors. The snow was three feet deep by sunrise, and most of the doors were jammed shut. The trains couldn't run through snow so deep. Even Cephas was feeling the effects of the blizzard, for though it was sheltered, it was still very cold. Only refuge was unaffected, save for some impressive icicles where their waterfall had been. In mountain shade, a few did manage to make it out of their houses. They all came right to Splims. The fires there were always hot, which was very attractive today. Splim opened the pantry to see what there was available. The food supplies were getting low. He had been depending on the food bank for replenishment. There was almost no meat, only a few eggs, and the milk, which had to be delivered fresh each day, was completely gone. Feather the waitress also saw how grim the situation was. "'What do we do, boss?' she asked in a somewhat hopeless tone. "'Do we have oats?' "'Plenty of oats.' "'Butter?' "'Lots of butter.' "'Syrup?' "'Yes.' "'Morgul, how are we doing on flour?' 
Lots of flour, boss. Here's what you do, Feather. Go out and tell everyone that today they are going to be treated to all you can eat, apple and oatmeal flapjacks, and it's on me. Feather went out to the dining room to carry out her orders. Splim heard cheering. He smiled to himself and got to work. Sopak had spent the night in a hole he had carved in a snowbank. The boy could no longer feel his toes, nor his fingers for that matter. He knew that he had to get up and keep going, but he was so very sleepy. Just a few more minutes. <laughs>